When it comes to conditions of the heart or cardiovascular system, we are very comfortable talking about things like cholesterol, blood pressure, or structural issues. But one aspect of heart health that gets almost no airtime is your nervous system. So your nervous system is in control of things like your heart rate, the force of your heart contractions, sending blood back to your head when you stand up too quickly, things like that. And when you have issues with the nervous system, you can have things like heart palpitations or flutters, changes to blood pressure, either high or low, swelling in your feet. There's a lot of things that can go on and nervous system disorders are almost never discussed. And if they are, things that are more common, like rhythm disorders, so an example of that would be atrial fibrillation, those are routinely checked upon. But if you have other disorders like POTS or other dysautonomias, which are less common, the workup is definitely not routine and many of these conditions go missed. Now this is because people are just starting to understand these conditions and realize how common they actually are. And so today, I really want to highlight the relationship between your nervous system and your heart, some of these conditions that you can look out for, and how to get them properly assessed. Because in my opinion, that is the first step in recovery is, do they even know what's going on with you and have they properly assessed this for you? But before I jump into that, I need to briefly introduce myself. My name is Dr. Robin Lewis. I'm a naturopathic physician practicing here in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. My hope is after today, you are educated enough on this topic that you can start the conversation with your doctor. Because a lot of the times people think these things have been assessed or ruled out and they actually haven't. And a lot of these doctors just aren't thinking about these peculiar nervous system disorders. They're often ruling out the big things like atrial fibrillation, like some of these more common disorders. And little do you know that these things weren't even assessed. So you go around thinking that you don't have these things and they just weren't assessing the right things. So being your own health advocate here can be incredibly helpful so you can have that intelligent conversation with your doctor. And if they're not well-versed in these things, there are other providers who will be. So let's start by going over first how your nervous system influences your cardiovascular system. Now, because I am focusing on some of these less common conditions, I'm going to be talking about how your autonomic nervous system specifically influences your cardiovascular system. Now this autonomic nervous system is broken into two different branches. We have our parasympathetic, which is our rest and digest state, and we have our sympathetic, which is our fight or flight state. I think a lot of us have heard this language used before, more when we're talking about stress, so when we're stressed, we go into a sympathetic mode. So our fight or flight, it causes our heart to race. We may sweat more, our blood sugar spikes. We start sending blood to our muscles so that our body can get prepared to fight or to run away. And so this is the type of topic that I'm talking about. As we can see, it influences a lot of different things. So I am going to be focusing more on how it influences the cardiovascular system, but that's what I'm talking about is this fight or flight mode, because oftentimes with people who are suffering from dysautonomias, they will have an imbalance in those two modes. So maybe they're too much in their sympathetic or their parasympathetic, or they'll have inefficiencies switching in and out of these modes. So they're not turning on the sympathetic mode when necessary, or at least not effectively doing so, and vice versa. To get just a little bit more specific, there is one particular type of nerve that often gets referenced when we talk about the autonomic nervous system, and that is our vagus nerve. So this is a very specific nerve that is involved in a lot of these autonomic functions like digestion and heart rate and things like that. And it's something that we can influence through things like breath work, 
cold showers. There's lots of different therapies that we target the vagus nerve with. And this is just to point out that it's not the entirety of the autonomic nervous system. It's not just the vagus nerve involved, but that is something that gets referenced a lot when you're talking about ways to help the autonomic nervous system, ways to help these people start to regulate these things a little bit better. So just briefly letting you know that this is a part of the equation. It's not the entire equation, but definitely relevant to understand the action of the vagus nerve if you're trying to help someone with their autonomic nervous system. Okay, so why do we care about the autonomic nervous system? What is it doing? Why are we talking about this? Well, first off, in relation to the cardiovascular system, it controls heart rate and the strength of your heart beats. So people who have, let's say, an over-exaggerated sympathetic response will have their heart race quicker than someone else. You can often feel your heart beating in your chest, and a lot of people will notice this changes and is exaggerated by the posture. So whether you're upright or lying down. Another aspect of your cardiovascular health that this nervous system influences is your blood pressure and your blood vessels ability to contract. So this is super relevant when we're talking about people who go from lying down to sitting up. In this scenario, your blood starts to drop to your feet because of gravity and your body needs to counteract that by contracting blood vessels, increasing your blood pressure and sending things back upright so you don't lose oxygen to the brain. And in people who have issues with this, they will often feel very dizzy, nauseous, and unwell when they stand up because their body's not very good at doing this. So people with dysautonomias who have an issue controlling these sort of things will get symptoms like I just described. Now the autonomic nervous system is involved in almost every single activity in your body. So they often will get other symptoms outside of the cardiovascular system. So this can involve things like your skin, your gut, your lungs, and so on. And I'm not gonna talk about those today because this will be an incredibly long episode if I did. But just know that these people who have these conditions will often get some of these cardiac symptoms, maybe not all of them, and other ones. All right, so now that we've highlighted the relationship between the autonomic nervous system and the cardiovascular system, let's talk about some of the common conditions that fall under the category of dysautonomias, meaning there's an issue with this relationship. The most common one we see is something called POTS, and this is essentially where someone will have very severe symptoms when they go from lying to standing up. And in this particular case, when they go to sit up, their heart rate goes extremely high. It can create a lot of dizziness. Sometimes people will faint, feel unwell, extremely tired, among some of these other non-cardiac symptoms. And this is because when you go to sit upright, approximately 20 to 30% of your blood gets shunted to your feet because of gravity. Now your body needs to counteract that. And in these particular people, they aren't very good at doing this. So it's just one of their issues with their autonomic nervous system that's creating a lot of dizziness and fatigue and nausea and things like that when they're sitting upright. The other one that is very common and you have likely heard of is called orthostatic hypotension. So similar in the sense that it's talking about going from lying down to standing up or sitting up, but in this case, their blood pressure will drop. And it can also present similarly in the fact that you will feel unwell, dizzy, lightheaded, and things like that when you go from lying to standing up. Now, a lot of people have heard of this because people who are, let's say, severely anemic will also get orthostatic hypotension. So this is referring to people who have this regardless of their other health markers. So this and a lot of the other conditions can be a byproduct of another condition, but we're talking about people who have issues 
with this because of their nervous system and it's not something you can necessarily correct by supplementing some iron or some b12 the last one i want to highlight for you is something called inappropriate sinus tachycardia and it is when someone has a chronically elevated heart rate because of a disorder of the autonomic nervous system now it too can look very similar to things like POTS. So this is really where you wanna find a doctor who's well-versed in this. As you can see from the list here, those are not the only three dysautonomias. And I can almost guarantee you, if you brought this entire list to one of your doctors, they would not have heard of half of the things on this list. And so I'm not gonna go over everything today because I'm not here to regurgitate a textbook back to you, but I want you to be aware of these terms so that if you do feel like you have an issue with your nervous system and it's creating a lot of the symptoms that you have, then these are things that you might wanna investigate on your own. And please go to a doctor who is more well-versed in dysautonomias as a whole, because these aren't as common and these require a very special type of workup. Now you might be wondering why someone is going to develop these sort of disorders, because for many people, this isn't something they've had since birth. So yes, genetics always plays a role in the sense that it will make you more susceptible versus someone else, but there usually needs to be something else to kind of trigger someone who is more susceptible or set them off for lack of better words. So as you will see, genetics does play a role, but there's other things that you wanna investigate. So for example, you wanna look at the immune system. More specifically, autoimmune conditions can be highly related to these dysautonomias. So things like Sjogren's, Hashimoto's, celiac disease, all of these other types of autoimmune diseases are very common in this population and likely are contributing to the severity of the symptoms. So for these people, a lot of the times you are trying to get the immune system back on track and that should help some of their other autoimmune symptoms, including these ones that have to do with the autonomic nervous system. There can be other immune issues that are not autoimmune in nature. So things like mast cell activation syndrome, which is a topic in of itself, um, that one can also be highly linked to dysautonomias. If we take this a little bit further, infections are a very common stress on the system that will burden the system to the point where things can start to pop off. So a really common thing that we'll see is Lyme disease attacking the nervous system and creating some of these dysautonomic symptoms. And post COVID, so long COVID, is very linked to dysautonomias. And in fact, they're finding that the majority of people who suffer from these post viral syndromes, so it's not just COVID that can do it, things like mono and other infections can do it as well. But in these particular people, it's the infection that set off the dysautonomia. Now, another thing that often gets overlooked when it comes to these patients is head injuries or things like concussions. So a lot of the times these individuals will get some of these similar symptoms. And it's often that it's pointed to the cerebellum, which regulates balance and things like that. But if there's also damage to these parts of the brain that regulate autonomic control, then you can also start to see a dysautonomia start to form in these particular people. On a similar line of thinking, things like post heart attack and stroke can also be involved because similar to head injuries, depending where the damage happens, it can create an issue in your autonomic nervous system that can cause someone to develop these sort of issues. Now, other things that put a stress on the system can often be triggers or at least something that exasperates someone's symptoms like sleep deprivation, high mental or physical stress, trauma, poor nutrition, poor exercise. So a lot of these things, if not necessarily a cause of the onset, they certainly are things to think about when it comes to managing your dysautonomia. And then the last thing I wanna say is please have a thorough workup 
because a lot of other conditions can give you symptoms of dysautonomia and it would be a product of that condition and not a true dysautonomia in of itself. So for example, thyroid issues can often lead to things like heart palpitations, spikes to blood pressure, all of these things that can look very similar to something like POTS can be induced by a different condition and the target of that therapy would be the thyroid in these examples. So again, just make sure you have a doctor who is ruling things out, but also able to rule things in. So this is where I wanna go with the very last thing I'm gonna talk about, and that is how do you actually get the dysautonomias properly assessed, and what are you looking for? For things related to posture, you're gonna to wanna to do things like a NASA lean test or a tilt table test. And so these are assessments where they're looking at your vitals, so things like heart rate and blood pressure while lying down and when you're standing up. And there's a specific way in which you can do this and if there's a certain level of severity to your symptoms when you're in different postures, it can point to different types of dysautonomias. You can also do certain types of reflex testing because your reflexes are often an insight into your autonomic nervous system. So there's something called a Q-sweat where they're looking at your body's ability to sweat in relation to certain hormones. So that could be something that they're potentially assessing. Like I was kind of getting at before, some good blood work can be very helpful. So looking for things like infections, looking for things like autoimmune antibodies and things like that. So this is not so much diagnosing the condition, but identifying potential triggers of your condition. 24 hour Holter monitors can be extremely helpful in these populations because a lot of the times your changes or your abnormal signs are very contextual. So they very much relate to certain scenarios. So if you're doing it in only a clinical setting where they're assessing your heart rate, you might not show up with symptoms. But then if you're wearing these monitors for the entire course of a day or several days, you might be able to pick up on patterns that are more indicative of something like a dysautonomia. There's also other types of autonomic nervous system assessments where they look at things like your pupils and stuff like that. And then another one that I'll get a lot of my patients on for general health, but very relevant for this population as well, is something that tracks your HRV. So devices like the Aura Ring or the Whoop Strap, where they're dedicated to measuring heart markers that will allow them to assess your heart rate variability, which is a reflection of your nervous system, how well you're able to flip in and out of sympathetic and parasympathetic, these devices are really good at measuring that and measuring other things that might be influencing your HRV. So this might not be so much a diagnostic tool, but it's definitely helpful for monitoring people's progress and response to treatment. So these are just some of the things that you can look at, but ultimately it's important to know that these sort of evaluations exist because if you really do feel strongly that this might be the case for you, you might have a dysautonomia. These are the type of things that your doctor should be talking to you about. So I hope that you found today's episode helpful. I hope that this gives you a bit of information so that you can be more confident in a conversation with your trusted healthcare provider. If you have any questions from today or if there are any other topics related to this that you'd like me to deep dive on, please let me know. I hope you guys have a wonderful day and thank you so much for listening.